911, what is the emergency? Yes, uh, uh, I think there's a, there's a fire in an uh, industrial park, Cape Coral. I'm watching the, 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 the fire from my house. We have breaking news to share with you after a 911 call about a fire was received earlier this morning. I'm blown. When we came home, there was crime scene tape everywhere. First responders made a gruesome discovery of two unidentified bodies. Tell his poor father and show him this picture and he had to identify him laying in the dirt dead. No one just stopped it. He's gonna kill me. This is the only thing. thing. This man is gonna kill me. You get in an abusive relationship, you have to get out. Where's burnt to a crisp, has no skin on his body because he's been fried. Their bodies were dumped less than half a mile less than a two blocks from this house. The industrial parks where they took the boys, you could actually see the sign from our backyard. You were there, so you had something to do with it, whether you want to or not. Even if she wanted to leave, she wasn't going anywhere. I, I don't have a choice because if I stay, I'm dead, but if I leave, I'm dead. I don't know if you're afraid of them or it's because of your feelings not, and you're trying to protect them. Ashley wasn't the only one that was afraid. I'll bet you all of them were afraid, and Kamar was even afraid. The students don't know, if I leave, I'm gonna be the one who's hunted down. 14-year-old kid is dead. I could be next. And you were there. I'm freaking out. I could be the one who's on the floor. I could be the one who's hogtied, being cut, being hurt. We didn't know what was going to happen next. And if you continue lying, creating this ridiculous story, ridiculous story. On the street is if you kill somebody and somebody's there, you're a witness. So guess what's going to happen to you? Right. You're going to get shot or, you, you know, something's going to happen to you. 17 years old and I don't know what you feel you owe Kamar. I don't know if you're afraid of him if he's ever threatened you. Inside of you, the fear is so great. Women make bad choices like that because of fear. It was a shock to the families of this community. We never believed that something like this could ever happen in our neighborhood. You put yourself in that position, just like these two put themselves in that position, okay? When someone is operating and using fear tactics to get to someone, it's powerful. What would you have done? Honestly. On October 7, 2006, cousins Alex and Jeffrey Sosa were found dead at the Industrial Park in Cape Coral. The fire is located at the Industrial Park in Cape Coral on the corner of Kismet Parkway and Andalusia Boulevard. The Cape Coral Police Department is currently investigating what appears to be a double homicide. Ashley Toy. I'm originally from New Jersey. I was born and raised there. Four or five years old, my mother left me and my twin sister and my brother. She was in and of our lives until I was about 13 years old, I want to say. After reading Ashley's story and hearing about her story, I think one of the things that first jumps off my page where you see her begin this path and this journey is the lack of, of a stable home. Came home from school, the door was wide open. We had we went, walked in there and we remember saying, screaming, you know, mom, we're home, and there was no answer. We saw this letter, we started reading it, and we just started crying. And it started off, I'm sorry, but I can't do this anymore. Blase, blase. Mom's in and out of the home, that causes issues. Uh, dad's always working, so there's no parent at home. Between that time, my father had moved down to Cape Coral, Florida. 
So when I'm reading her story, I'm, I'm actually looking at what she went through as a child with her mom leaving. Because we were totally abandoned, we didn't even know where to go. She yearned inside of her to have family. It was our first time taking plane. Me and my sister came down here to Cape Coral, Florida with her father. So she goes from uh, not having a stable home, not having help at home, to then we see the school issues where now she's uh, bouncing from school to school, her grades start slipping, all those kind of things. And what we don't always understand and realize is each one of those affects the other. We ended up starting school again. Now she's, she's searching for significance and then she runs into some boys. through my history class. When you become a victim, this does not happen overnight. You know, at first, it was good. You know, I was getting the attention I so was yeah, craving so for. You know, I wasn't getting it from my father. I wasn't getting it from anywhere else. So this man comes and I, he's, I mean, wow. She's 15 years old. She starts looking at him as someone that can take care of her. At the time of these murders, I lived in the neighborhood and I can tell you, everybody knew who Kamar was. My father knew about it, but he didn't like it. He didn't like it at all. He knew off the top. I mean, this man was not good for me. It turns out he was a drug dealer. And so I got into the street life. Kamar was always playing basketball in the neighborhood. If you happen to make eye contact with him, he would give you this look, uh, you know, you know, the look. Maybe somewhere along the line, she did see that this wasn't working. But there's something called control. Power and control over a human being. Growing up, the way I grew up, without the stability that I had, I was always in the street life. So I knew how it worked. Kind of, yeah, yeah both worlds. It's so easy to fall into becoming a victim without you even noticing it. And I ended up falling in love with this man. Um, he takes care of me, he buys me things. I mean, it's lovely at first. What more can a 15 year old ask for, you know? An abuser is like an undercurrent that you just never know when it's gonna come. And by time it's there, you're gone and you're dead. Things eventually spun out of control for me. The relationship we see between Ashley and Kamar goes from what you would call a typical relationship, I guess, to abusive. Thought this man was my life. And one day I was being yeah. choked because he got mad at me for, I wanna say, forgetting something at the store or I was looking at his friend the wrong way or something. One day I was pulling out of my driveway and I pulled into the intersection and there stood Kamar. He took his hand he pointed it like a gun at my head and went boom, like he was gonna kill me. What was he doing? He was trying to intimidate me. He was planting fear. And he ended up choking me. I remember it the first time. I ended up passing out to him. I woke up saying that he would never do it again. He is so sorry. I'm sure that you asked her, well, when he was strangling you, didn't you think that at that time you should leave? So of course I believed him. How can somebody, you know, you love me, how can you do this to me? So of course I fell for it. If you don't get out quick, then you're gonna be stuck in a cycle and it's very hard to get out of it. I was very, very naive. I was only 15, I met him when I was 15 years old. He was just choking me. He never hit me. Well, that's worse than getting slapped in the face because in less than four minutes, you can be dead. I knew it was wrong in my head, but my heart, was not allowing me to believe that it can happen again or that it would cause something so bad in the future. And you hear this from girls who've been in this uh, relationship before is, oh no, he really loves me, he didn't mean it. It's my first time I, in love. Why would he do this to me? Why, because she, in, she's in the victim mode. The beatings continued um, and um, this first time he hit me, I didn't think anything of it, I mean, I'm not saying that because you're a victim, then that means that you should victimize. This is the only person that loves me. This is the only person that showed me time. This is the only person that, that, that I feel like will take care of me. And if I leave, I've got no one. Carl time. 
so Ashley's in this relationship and she's dealing with Kamar and it becomes more and more physical, more and more dangerous, more and more uh, for her feeling to the point where not only is she trapped in her own psychological mind, in her own personal life, I don't have anywhere to go, I don't know who to trust. He started abusing me very, very bad. Remember, an abuser takes the role that you belong to me. Kept saying, he loves me, he loves me. Of course, I'm still young. I'm still believing this man. I don't want him to get anywhere. I'm getting to the point where, you know, he's beating me in a, I have no place to go. Again, another thought that we see with, with people who are in these types of relationship is, if I leave, where do I go? So I need you type thing. I, I had no choice. I didn't know, I didn't know where to go. There was nothing I could do. I felt stuck. Because I care. I love you. He got to the point where he would choke me and then I was getting whipped with belts. I was getting guns drawn and pointed to my head. I was getting beat punched so badly on my arms and legs to where the next morning I could not walk. I mean, he, he started treating me so bad. He had um, nailed down the windows, locked her in closets, beat her with belts. She's got nowhere to go because she's afraid of what he'll do. I couldn't understand it. I promise you, it'll never happen again. If I leave, he's going to come get me. If I leave, he's going to go after my family. I was, the only thing I was thinking to myself, why do I deserve something like this? I care about you, and I'm so sorry. I don't know why I did this. I don't. It's not fair. Why? 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 So the beatings, maybe I could put up with a little bit with this because this is okay. It's a crazy, vicious cycle that unfortunately, until a person is willing to break it, they will be stuck in the cycle. And she must have been petrified. I had to stay in the house. I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't talk to anybody. He had me locked in his room. It was to the point where I was his dog. I witnessed domestic violence firsthand. I watched my mother go through this. And I also would say, why are we not leaving? Please, God in heaven, can we go? So all these doubts come into play in your mind, and so then you actually rationalize yourself out of getting help. Why is she falling in the trap again? Because she feels alone, because her self-esteem is low, because he has beat her down. We don't know in that specific relationship, but there have been cases where uh, the one party will tell the other, if you leave, I'll kill you. And becoming a victim, when you leave an abuser, it's almost an addiction. It's almost a heroin. He loves me, and I love him. We're gonna get married one day. And so, because I don't wanna be alone, I'll put up with this. You know, you leave him, or eventually you're gonna wind up in the body bag. I could not see it until it, it took me to come to a place like this. Kamar's birthday. Okay, it's Kamar's birthday, so this is my boyfriend's birthday. I have to be there. I have to go to the mall. I was at the mall that whole week, and I was getting him presents. I'm, I can't wait. This is my boyfriend's birthday. And, you know, I'm happy. I'm excited. Well, as the night unfolds, I want to I say 30, 40, 50 people end up coming. It's a block party. So we get the party, and the problem with the party, one, my first question is, as a um, professional, I will say, where are the parents? Do the parents know your kids are at? Street party, everybody's coming. There's liquor, there's drugs, everything. We know there were several young people, 14 and up, that was at that party that night. 14 years old. There's music, there's dancing going on, so everybody's showing up. You've got drugs and alcohol, which always make for bad choices. They do not help you make good decisions. They actually increase your ability to make bad decisions. Everybody's drinking, everybody's smoking, everybody's taking pills, so people are messed up. And when you have a, young, a lot of young people and they're doing all this, things happen. <sighs> she just, I mean, everybody's drunk, mm -hmm. high, doing whatever. Who had control over all these young people? Things begin to happen and they take a turn for the worst. I remember hearing yelling out in the living room, so we were like, what the heck? So we went out there. And the party things begin to go wrong. The people that showed up at the party, 
they had some problems with Kamar's friends in the past, so them showing up at this party was the ultimate disrespect. They should have never been in there to begin with, and they were in the streets. You're showing up at my party knowing mm -hmm. that we have some unresolved drug issues or we have some conflicts. Just mm -hmm. period. There's something, there was something there. So when they showed up, it made the boys um, get angry and mad, and they were holding up a cell phone conversation. And I want to say one of them was threatening the other. I'm not really sure how it is to this day. It made them mad. It made everybody mad, so they ended up fighting. And fear begins to take control, and so you have students that are calling out, making decisions, and pulling out guns, and pulling out knives. All these people are jumping on these boys, so it's a big, big fight. If someone does that, there's a panic that sets in. Beer bottles are being smashed, everything just going everywhere. It's happening like this. Right. I personally, I did not know what to do. I was like, oh my God, I was freaking out. So do I run? If I run, where do I go? You know, I was trying to say stop. Every, you know, back up, but who am I to say? That's how I felt, who am I? And really what you see is fear. There's nothing I can say to make him stop doing what he's doing. But there's 30 to 50 witnesses to this, is that what uh, you're pretty saying? Pretty much. And they all witnessed what you guys were getting ready to do to these two young boys? They witnessed a lot, I So they didn't say. scatter and say, we need to get the heck out of here. They watched. Uh, a lot of people did, yeah. They didn't need to stay, but they feared for their life, so they knew also. So he had some control over them also. Something about snitches, da da da, get out. If I run, and especially in the issue of guns and that kind of thing, am I gonna get shot because I'm leaving? So he gave them a chance. You know, everybody, at this point, you have to know who this man is to, you know, everybody was Afraid scared of him, Kamar. I wanna say. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to deal with him. He was a drug dealer. That was Kamar, you don't mess with him type right. stuff. He was the big dude of the town. So, some left, some stayed. Students don't know, if I leave, I'm gonna be the one who's hunted down. I could be next. I could be the one who's on the floor. I could be the one who's hogtied. I could be the one. So what do I do? The fight ends up happening and things just quickly, quickly spun out of control. Witnesses stated in the court records that Tyler Cox, a 14-year-old kid, punched Alex so hard that his grill went flying and hit the floor. Somebody needs to make a good decision and leave. The problem is, if you do that, you could very well be the next one who's on the floor being shot, being cut, being hurt. It was the beatings, the torture. They ended up, they were beating him up, they, were, they tied him up. Um, some of it I saw, some of it I didn't. Guns been out. They've been there since the start of it. I remember he, um, oh, he was so messed up too. Um, <clears throat> He ended up yelling, whoever's, I'm not gonna be the only one going down for this, so whoever's, whoever, who, I'm not gonna be the only one going down, so everybody's doing something, something. So, he, so I'm thinking, I'm, I'm not, I don't even know what to think right now, because it's happening so fast. What he said, that was for everybody else, but not for his group. The court records show that Kamar ripped off Alex's t-shirt, and then he took a flip open knife, and he started carving CF into his back. He did it first, and then I think like the point he was trying to get across to us, I mean, he just did it, so he's gonna hand the knife to Melissa. So Melissa is like, she's kind of stuck too, like what the heck, you know what I'm saying? And she just goes down there and she cuts him, does what she has to do, and here comes me. Oh God. She did not have a choice to say well, I'm leaving, because where is she going? I ended up bending down, I remember, and I ended up doing something. They, they said it was an asterisk. Now the boys are still alive at this mm -hmm. point. She wasn't going anywhere. Yes, I'm And what do you think is going on in their mind is they've already been beaten now at this point. Uh -huh. They've been tied yeah. up. Yeah. And now they're being, their backs are being cut into yeah. by all of you. And then there was another report. You poured bleach into the wounds. You didn't do it. No, but somebody no, no, poured no. bleach down into the wounds. Yes. 
torture. Mm -hmm. There was a lot going on. It was like a freaking movie. He orchestrated all of this. And we still have all these other people at the party watching this. They're not doing nothing. They're just watching They're not it. doing nothing. And they were like the musicians in the background just going, going along with what he was saying. Nobody was doing anything. Hmm. Torture, torture, and tortured. There's no other way of saying that. These kids, these two boys, were tortured to death. Put the victims in the car, the two boys at the time. The ones that left and never called law enforcement? To, at this point, we were trying to get out. We didn't know what was gonna happen next. There were young people that left, that they just went home and said, I don't want no part. And you know, sometimes this thing about we don't want no part and maintaining ourselves neutral, it's just as bad as the one that's doing it. You know, it's really not a shock to me that Kamar was involved in something like this, but I'll tell you, it did shock me. There was that many young people that stayed and listened to him and followed his orders. That was a shocker. And we did not think it was gonna be what they were, did, but we know what they have done so far is some pretty serious crap, and we are already, we don't wanna see any more of this. Mm -hmm. So we tried to go out and we tried to leave. I tried telling him, come on, come on, I'll be right back. You know, I'm trying to act all content and nonchalant. We're gonna be right back. You know, I'm gonna go to the store. Oh no, <laughs> I wasn't going nowhere. And I believe they stayed for one reason. They were afraid of what Kamar was gonna do if they walked out on him. I that. was going right with him. And if he let me out, of my, out no, he was not letting me out of, that, out of his sight. I was with him everywhere. Now this, Mind you, this happened way before this stuff, so I'm with him. He's not letting me go nowhere. Okay. So I, I was stuck. And that no one, no one, no one just stopped it. No one stopped it. My heart absolutely ripped when I heard that father plead. After you tortured him for hours, did you have to kill him? I ended up getting in the car with him. He ended up driving to the um, construction Industrial site park. where yeah. this happened mm -hmm. at. Um, his friend's car is in front of us, and I want to say another car is in back of us, which he told them to follow us also. I believe they felt they did. We ended up getting to the construction site, but they ended up getting shot. Yes, they ended up shooting them. And there's so many victims in this, and this is what's so sad. We all get into the car, I ended up, we all end up going back to the apartment. I believe they were afraid of the consequences. The boys are so messed up. Some of them fall asleep, some of them don't. I remember Kamar going into the bedroom. I remember me, I was right behind him. And he just passed out. The people that were involved in it, they were victimized also with this whole thing and now their lives are, 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 are destroyed. I'm sitting there. I'm blown right now. So there's so many victims, and then the families. He just killed somebody. He, somebody people. shot somebody, that's all I know. And those gunshots were echoing in my mind. And I have been through stuff in the street life before, but never to the point where somebody actually has died from mm -hmm. getting shot. This night changed everybody's life forever. You get shot, or you, you know, something's gonna happen to you. This boy might shoot me. Look what he just did. Where does this go? How do I do this? The only thing I can tell you is you have to stand up and do the right thing. Doing the right thing, it may cost you, it may hurt you, it may do it, but it's always the right thing to do. We ended up going back to the apartment. Two of them ended up going back, pouring gasoline on the car and setting it on fire. Nine one one. What is your emergency? I actually I live up in North Cape, and I just walked outside, and there's a uh, looks like there's a house a couple streets over from me. There's a ton of smoke coming up from it. So the next morning we wake up, um, it ends up being all over the news. What's going on? Good morning, Southwest Florida. We have breaking news to share with you. After a nine one one call about a fire was received earlier this morning. The Cape Coral Police Department is currently investigating what appears to be a double homicide. 
first responders made a gruesome discovery of two unidentified bodies. Mm -hmm. He's sitting there watching it. Everybody's watching it. I'm sitting there like, great. Okay, now I know these, they really killed them. They're dead now. What's gonna happen to me? That's the only thing I'm, I'm thinking, wow. You know, yeah. ugh, I'm stuck. Why are you not running? Get out. Where is she going as a victim? Someone that has, that has threatened her, that has beat her up. Fear is crippling and it will make you do the darndest things. Things that you could sit back in a safe place and see why are you not getting out? Leave, run, something. We're at Street Terms, um, his trap house. All his windows are screwed in. So really? just in case if we get, he gets robbed, nobody's getting in the windows, nobody's coming through the doors because he got deadbolt. You know, it's all bolted some way, somehow. His um, living room is filled with all, them, all the boys that were there, my code of fence at this time. So I'm not going anywhere. I'm not even going to try. So mm -hmm. I stayed, in, I mean, I was thinking about I could see that. going out the window. You know, I'm not going, I already know better. Why would I do that? There's mm -hmm. no way. It's so easy to be judgmental and to say, well, oh, come on, but she had an opportunity. Maybe she did, but there comes a point when you're being victimized like that. I just witnessed something, murder, maybe, possibly. I'm not knowing if they're really dead yet. You know what I'm saying? I'm not thinking about that right now. I'm thinking about, oh my God, whatever this man just did, I'm, I'm, I'm freaked out now. Mm -hmm. He's gonna kill me. Inside of you, the fear is so great that there's no way out. I was scared. I really was. I was really scared. I didn't know what he was going to do. OK, he might not do it tonight, but tomorrow when we wake up, he might have a different change of plans. He's not going to let me out of this house. The police ended up getting in, in touch with my dad, so he knew I was a witness or I was a, a witness. I was a witness at first to something. Do you want to be a witness to this, or do you want to be an accomplice to this? I was a witness. They questioned me at least three times. Do you know what a first degree murder sentence carries in the state of Florida? Life in prison without possibility of parole. They had warned Ashley over and over, if you continue to lie for Kamar, you are looking for the death penalty or life without parole. She continued to stick up for him and lie. I lied. If you lie to us and you were there and you know what happened, that's called accessory to what happened to these two guys. What happened to them? Murder. You got it. I did anything I could. I was not telling them what happened. Why would I do that? Would you? I'll tell you one more time. I'll tell okay. you one more time. I've never seen these kids in my life. Maybe they were there, maybe they weren't. I don't know. What people don't know when she is lying right here to, with the police footage, Kamar is free. He's over in Miami and she has got to be out of her mind wondering what is gonna happen if I get out of here, I tell the truth of what happened that night, he is gonna kill me. And you've never seen this guy before, right? I've never seen him. Uh, when, like I said, How about that? Have you seen him? Have you seen him before? Because this is the person who I had to go and tell his poor father and show him this picture and he had to identify him laying in the dirt, dead. And I say that to people all the time today. What would you have done? Now, do you know this guy? Do you want to see his picture? Where he's burnt to a crisp, has no skin on his body because he's been fried. Honestly. Do you want me to show you his picture? You better come off of this crap right now. 14-year-old kid is dead. And something happened with this kid at that party, and I am not understanding how you're sticking up for some jerk-off that's stepping out on you. I'm 17. I've been beaten with belts, locked in rooms. I've just seen him kill two people, and I, for some reason, I'm not supposed to be afraid. I was arrested on all these charges. Do you have a heart? These people died in the dirt. One of them died in the trunk, burned to death. He was there at the wrong place at the wrong time. He had nothing to do with it. He was beaten, shot, not once, not twice, not three, not four, not five, not six, seven times. He's hanging out with his uncle just trying to have something to do on a Friday night. That's his uncle? Yep. I thought that was brother. No, that's his uncle. 
Why do we not believe she is so afraid of what's going to happen if she tells the truth? We find on the third interrogation that Kamar had been arrested. Now she feels secure to tell the truth. And then on top of that, she finds out she's pregnant. What happens? We were all having fun okay. at the beginning. Aunt started with them. They were saying like, whoever's got problems with these kids, come and get your hits on now. All hit them. Everybody had a punch. Whatever. That's when people started leaving. Some okay. stayed. Is this the doorway that goes out to the garage? Can we say that? Yeah. The sink. Mm-hmm. Is the stove. And where is the pantry? Right here. Are there doors the on the pantry? Yeah. Where were you at? Oh, right in the doorway. In the kitchen? Mm-hmm. Half in, you know, half in the kitchen, half right out. That's when, like, they tied them up. What were they tied up with? Shoelaces, I'm pretty sure. What yeah, color were the it. shoelaces? Black. Somebody said that one of the times when Alex got punched, he got punched so hard that his grill fell out and fell onto the kitchen floor. They had their hands behind their back and their feet, and their stomachs on the floor. Were both boys tied up at the same time? Mm-hmm. I think somebody was putting cigarettes out on them. What else? Besides the salt and the water and the cigarettes, wasn't there yet one more item? It was bleach used. Yeah. I understand that there's also a taser involved somewhere along the way? Yes. Yeah. Where did she taser him at? So, Rod was pointing the gun at Alex, and he was sitting on the floor. And he's the one who said if they moved, he'd shoot him? Yeah. Now, who was it that yelled at some point, all snitches leave? Or did that. Okay, Kamar's one who yelled, yeah, all snitches yell leave? That. And you said that all of this started with somebody playing a cell phone message, right? Yeah, that is true. Anything to do with the letters CF for cash fiends? Oh, yeah. She put in FW for free rhythm. Where did she put that at? On his back. What did she put it on there with? Knife. Any yeah. type of a uh, symbol other than CF or FW? Yeah. Can you draw it for me, please? This is where I come in. This is where you come in? So at this point, there's carving there's tortures. So you guys all go outside. Yep. They had permanent chunks. So you get to the job site. Yeah. And then what happened? Then all the boys got out, opened it, and they all started firing. We all left. Mm -hmm. And Aunt had went back with the gasoline because I heard him talking. I, I knew he went because he came back and he's like, I just went to burn it on fire. The whole thing blew up. Well, I want to say for about a week and a half before they arrested all of us. They told me I was too much pregnant and I had no idea. You got too much problems. What about, what about Sosa's father who has to bury his son tomorrow? I ended up being in county for six months. I don't think you give a f that this happened to him. I don't think you give a so There was two victims they charged me with. Two counts of murder for each. I don't think you give a Two counts of kidnapping. But I was getting burned to a crisp. And two counts of aggravated battery. I didn't think it was going to be this serious, you know? and one tampering with evidence. Nobody ever thinks it's going to be that serious. And I got the most charges at everybody. I bet your aunt and them didn't think it was going to be that serious. Uh, you know, yeah. you don't think that way. Just one sure. thing leads to another. I went to trial. Do you think Kamar has any loyalty to you? I was the first to go to trial. I was in six months of Capitol Murder case. You could do so much better than him. Uh, oh my God, you got to be kidding me. I got found guilty. He's wrong on you unbelievably. It nauseates me. Of all that, principal to murder. And you're going to be loyal to him? I was there. I didn't call the police. Whoa, over here, huh? Are you kidding me? 
I got seven charges total from that night. And uh, that was a blow. 10 people were charged and convicted of their murders. One of the convicted killers is Ashley Toy. A jury found Toy guilty based on events that occurred when she was 17 years old. Pregnant at the time, Toy was given two life sentences with no possibility of parole. What she did and what the uh, young man did and the people that were involved was totally horrific. It was horrible, totally horrible. This happening to me definitely opened my eyes. And I wanna say, I started to believe everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. Like we said, I could have been dead. My son could have been dead, being that I was too much pregnant and didn't even know it. So when we look at Ashley's situation, we're looking at that she, because remember, we allow it. Nobody's supposed to make you do something you don't want to do. And I was smoking weed and drinking, and I didn't even know. I was harming myself, not only me, but my baby. In Ashley's case, do I think her punishment was uh, fair? Um, I'll say this, I think Ashley took some bad advice when it came to settling. Um, she thought that if she went to court that she would have a better chance of, of rather than the plea deal. And the plea deal was probably enough punishment. Um, and so she went to court anyway and she got worse. And sometimes you take that chance when you do that. And I can tell you by talking to Ashley that she believes with everything in her, I'm gonna take my chances with court because I did not kill anybody. I did not pull the trigger. Yes, I was there. Yes, I did some bad things, but I did not murder anybody. You know, all this stuff I think about, I'm like, wow. This could happen, this could happen, this could happen. And it was only by God that I was placed in a situation like this, I mean. Because we have to also look at what a victim is doing. The victim is allowing for someone to have power and control over them. And I'm not saying, oh, poor Ashley. She had a hard childhood. So that gave her a license to do what she did. That is absolutely not what I'm saying at all. To outsiders, it is horrible. A life sentence, no parole, I have a baby in the prison system. It was bad for me too, trust me, but when I sit here and I think about it, I was blessed. I consider myself blessed because I am alive. He took me out of that situation because I could not get myself out. That's how far gone I was. That's how stuck I was in his little cage and I couldn't get myself out. There's no, no way out for her. That, that is what it is. Um, it might be a little harsh considering if you understand the psychological trauma that a person goes through when they feel manipulated, that she doesn't have a way out. She doesn't feel like she has a way out. And you have to learn as a victim to be able to, once again, get your power and control back. There is a price to be paid and I'm sorry, but these kids that were involved in that and torturing these kids, they are going to have to pay that price. Blame myself for that happening because I feel like I was not strong enough to help those people if I could have. Would I have been able to? And the answer I tell myself is no. I don't think you would have. I couldn't point. have. What, 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 stop? Don't do that? Where was that gonna get me? That was gonna get me nowhere. If anything, it would've got me a blow right to the nose. There is a way out. You have to trust your counselors, your professionals, but you can't just sit in it and stay in it because if you do, there are consequences. But again, that's something I have to live with for the rest of my day. You know, and I know I couldn't have, but there's something in me that I wished you I wish could have. have. I wish I would've been strong enough to be able to Say no, Stand up. I'm not. Everything we do in life has consequences. The question is, is whether you see the consequences before you do your actions. Because sometimes we, we make choices, we do things, and we don't always see the consequence before we make those choices. To remember one thing about a victim. 
And sometimes we don't want to accept it because how could you? How could you? They love their abuser. There's no doubt in my mind that she loved him and you could really see it when the detective tells her, didn't you know he was cheating on you? She's devastated. Absolutely devastated. You didn't know that he was seeing somebody else? They love him, but for real, they love him. Ashley. And they don't even know how it got that way. You had no idea that he was seeing anyone else? And love is not something you turn off and on. And some of them, they're there till, till death. That's something I have to live with every day. Right. <laughs> and that's what happened to Ashley. But. And some of the signs are right there. God, you see those first signs of abuse, anything you're getting cussed out, go. So when she started dating him, was he calling her 10 times a day? She probably thought that he was calling her 10 times a day because he loved her so much and he missed her. No, he was calling her 10 times a day because he wanted to know where she was at because of his insecurities. So that's a form of control. I'm telling you firsthand, go. Because I do not want anybody to end up in my situation. I do not wish this on anybody. Did he tell her, oh, I'll go with you. Oh, we'll go do this together. Why? Did he really need to go to Ross with her? And I want them to please, please <laughs> learn from this. If she's on the phone, who are you texting? Right away, oh, he loves me because he's jealous. You better believe it, he's jealous. And that's not a good thing. That's power and control right there. So there's signs to look for. People do not understand that when you have been beaten down and you're in a situation like this, that you are out of your mind afraid to leave. There's signs to look for, and not just for her at this point, but for any young person or for any female or for any man. If you are seeing those signs, you better stop. If your significant other, your, your partner, your wife, whatever, has to call you 10 times or 15 times or text you 15 times, there's a problem. That's a red flag. What's sad about it is nobody's ever going to understand unless they've been through it. Right. If you've been through it, then you could, you already know where, you know, you know. My sister was murdered and my mother lived in a domestic violent relationship with alcoholism, all kinds of things that went on. You, you get hit one time, that means the <clears throat> lethality, it will increase. Especially when there's alcohol and there's drugs involved. The, the lethality just continues to escalate and escalate. So I understand what, how devastating this can be and how crippling this can be. Uh, domestic violence does not discriminate. The CDC reports from the ages of 13 to 18, one out of five girls are going to experience rape, sexual assault, beatings, or domestic type violent relationships. Well, for you, your message to young girls is to at least look at their situation. They might be in a relationship that they can see warning signs. This person that you're with needs help. And you need to recognize it. And that's good to cut it off at the beginning, real quick. I mean, you had a ton of them now in hindsight, right? Yeah. The first time he choked you should have been your first yeah. sign. So threats are real coming from an abuser. You are afraid to tell anyone because you really don't know what the outcome is going to be. And what if they find out there is a real threat, a real fear that you're not going to really get to a safe place. But even as an adult, we've seen women make bad choices like that because of fear and because of doubt, because I don't know who to turn to. You know, I in knew your heart, in my mind right. it was wrong. Because that will not change. As soon as you start living with that person, that, that will just increase, that would magnify itself, and you're gonna find yourself in a lot of trouble. I understand the fear factor, and I understand it's gonna take real guts and courage 
to get you and your kids or your family to a safe place. When it comes to domestic violence and sexual assault, this is so huge. And this is something that we as a society, and especially as a church, we do not want to deal with. Well, just because it happened to you does not mean it's going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, <laughs> it's happened to me. It happened to everybody else it happened to, too, that told me the same exact thing. So I would say you better uh, wake up, smell the coffee, because eventually, if it doesn't happen to you then, it's eventually gonna lead you down the wrong road and something's gonna happen. It always does. When an abuser is telling you, I will kill you, maybe he's not gonna kill you right then, and that's the sad thing with the victim, that even though she's all bruised up, but he didn't kill me, but I should not have told him that. You see, if I would not have used that word that he doesn't like, we would have been just fine. You could help them. Yeah. That's, that was my biggest problem. I felt like I could help him. Mm -hmm. But I can't. That's the biggest lesson. You can't help somebody that doesn't want to be helped. You cannot. I know that once we're together, he's going to change. He's going to stop drinking. He's going to stop doing drugs. He's going to, you know, he's going to care for me more. Um, no, that's not going to happen. You have to make a plan, implement the plan, and it is going to take courage and it's going to take guts. Oh, you're finally going to listen. You're actually going to listen and see the signs or he will kill you. God, I just, I just, you just, I just hope they, they need to open their eyes, realize there's so much more to life. Tragedy is going to hit every one of us. There will always be something in our lives that causes us pain, that causes us hurt, that causes us guilt. The question is, once that hits, how will I move forward? I, I can't even, I don't even know what to say. I am so sorry that they had to experience something like this and become victims also. This story is tragic and it's a really hard one to tell and to listen to. It's gut-wrenching, it's stupid, it's senseless. My heart does break for the family members of these two boys. When somebody is involved in any kind of domestic violence, and I have to look at it in the aspect of domestic violence, there's all these other victims that are involved. There, all, all these people became victims of this one person because they followed along when they had a choice and they could have done something. I hope that the families that, that were dealt this tragedy I hope that they are able to forgive and move on. So my heart goes out to them. I hope they've been able to move on. Forgiveness is tough. It's not always easy, it's not always clean. I get it, I know how hard it would be to let this go. I wanna say that this is how I would deal with it. I wanna say this is how you, but I don't know how to deal with it. I do know the, the proper way as far as what the Bible would say is I have to forgive. Does that mean that, that I don't let the justice system work or that I forget what's happened? No, um, I'm going to forgive for my own peace of mind. And then I'm gonna let justice take its course. I'm gonna let the courts do their thing. I'm gonna allow that to happen. Um, that's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to keep moving on and keep moving forward. The best thing we can do for the Sosa family is to tell this story in hopes of impacting the lives of others. Things will never be the same. Life will never be the same. It's not fair. It's not right. It will never be. Hopefully this message will get out to other people in domestic violent relationships and that we will never forget what happened here. I think when teenagers and, and even people go through this issue, they have to find a place where what gives you value and meaning. I believe that comes from God. Will someone else believe that? No. But if they don't believe that, then where does your value come from? I did give my life to God. I went to church one day and I just, whew, 
just that Holy Spirit came over me and I was, I went up to that altar and I got prayed for and I really genuinely put my heart and soul into that and I prayed. And I said, Lord, take this away from me. All this pain and despair and me feeling guilty about things I should not be feeling, you know, guilty about, take it all away. And I'll be darned he did. Because if you don't know where your value comes from, then you're searching for someone else to give you life and meaning. I don't think that happiness comes from another person. I get my happiness from God. And so if I will get happiness from God, I don't require someone else to make me happy. I mean, when you're, like when you're really <laughs> um, willing to give it all away and willing to trust fully in Him, God. it works. <laughs> I'll tell you, it works. So that's the difference, at least from the biblical side of it, from that side of it, is if you understand where that value comes from, then you can have meaning. Then you're not tied down as far as, I need this person to give me the ability to move forward, the ability to understand where my wealth or where my identity comes from, because it doesn't come from any of those things. It comes from God.